All right, well, welcome. We're glad you're here, and we're glad that you joined us tonight uh, for our devotional, and we're going to get started in just a minute. I'd just like to say uh, that when you share the live feeds, uh, it, it makes a dramatic difference in how many people are impacted by our devotionals and by our worship. So if you have a chance, make sure uh, that you share the live feed every time you come on uh, Facebook uh, with Cornerstone. So let's just get started tonight uh, with a prayer, and then Chase will start us off. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing of coming together as a church and learning more about you and discussing your word and uh, coming to learn more about discipline so we might draw closer to you and draw closer to one another. Thank you, Lord, for this church and all the uh, wonderful people in it. Thank you for the many blessings that they have been in my life. Lord, we ask a special blessing on all those people who are suffering tonight uh, with COVID-19. We just, we just want to ask that uh, you help them, that you help heal them, and that you, most of all, Lord, send your comforter to go through this difficult time with all the people who are sick. Thank you, Lord, again for the many blessings that we have in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Chase? All right, so today we're diving into the discipline of fasting. This is the third of the inward disciplines. So that's disciplines focused on improving your own personal spiritual life. So there's a common analogy of being on a plane and the plane is crashing and folks are being instructed to help themselves before they reach out in order to help others. So the inward disciplines are geared toward helping ourselves. A few weeks ago, we talked a little bit about meditation, uh, the purpose of which is to become still and centered in the presence of God. All right, the next step was prayer, which is the real meat and potatoes of the entire Christian life. Uh, prayer means that you are participating in the meaningful conversation that God wants from you, both speaking and listening, but mostly listening. So, meditation is a doorway to prayer, so we meditate to become still to better pray. So this week, the emphasis is on fasting, uh, which has a lot of purposes, but the, the biggest of which is simply to go into a period of time with the intention of there being less of self and more of God. All right, fasting can kind of be synonymous with uh, abstaining. It's like spiritual abstaining. When you fast from anything to make room for your life for God, you're abstaining. All right, so most of the time fasting is in reference to abstaining from food, and it's been rare, and dare I say almost never, uh, that I've heard of this discipline being practiced in the modern church, especially in our tribe, which kind of brings up this question in my mind, like what, well, why would the modern church disregard fasting and cons uh, well, considering it's, it was practiced so frequently throughout the entire scripture and Christians of past centuries. All right, the Middle Ages probably have something to do with it, considering it was practiced with very rigid regulations and no mercy and literal self-flagellation, which most people looked at it and were like, yeah, I'll pass. But also, the past couple centuries have conformed to the general belief uh, that if we don't have three meals a day, that we're on the brink of starving and it feels too inconvenient and that there are severe health consequences, uh, therefore making it obsolete and unnecessary. And I want to clarify, responsible fasting is all about connecting with God and becoming less so that he can become more. Absolutely. Fasting is not simply a, a healthy diet plan. Um, and there are some people who just shouldn't fast from food based on their current medical situation. Um, but it can have some good health effects for the average person if it's done for small periods of time, and that's about 24 to 36 hours at a time. All that is to say, it's pretty ingrained in many of us that fasting is either a bad idea um, or it's not spoken of and therefore, in a sense, non-existent and unnecessary. With fasting, we've considered it out of sight, out of mind. Um, and many of us, including myself, think of fasting and almost at the same time instantly think of our objections to it. And so for me, it's because I most certainly have an addiction to salt and sugar and fat and carbs, and giving up food is not easy. Uh, but, and that's a big but, Scripture has a ton to say about fasting. And in the Bible, fasting is an essential practice for most every single person in what we would consider a faith hall of fame. 
Um, and I mean in general, not just the people from the Old Testament mentioned in Hebrews 11. Um, and that's going to be people like Moses or David or Elijah or Esther or Daniel or Paul, and not to mention Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, God in the flesh fasted. And I generally hold to the, ph- to the philosophy that uh, whatever Jesus practiced while he was on earth is worth imitating. So before Keith and John, John David dive deeper into understanding what fasting looked like in the Bible and its basic purposes, I would want to encourage you to try to look at fasting through a brand new lens. And uh, to move forward from here, practicing this art of surrendering yourself and consequently letting more of God into your life. So Keith is going to elaborate on what fasting looked like in the Bible. Keith? All right. So we need to understand... Uh, what fasting looks like in the Bible. Just a a quick glance, uh, I could find at least 15 different times of fasting in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you can divide these uh, fastings into several main categories. They typically fall into one of these three categories. First, pleading with God, uh, mourning or repenting, and then third, spiritual direction or discernment. And there are two types of fasting in the Bible uh, that we could talk about also, corporate fasting or individual fasting. And then if we wanted to, we could divide them again into other categories like fasting from just food or fasting from food and water or fasting from something uh, like sex or fasting only uh, when the sun is up. Uh, For the sake of this time, uh, we're just going to concern ourselves with the first uh, two categories. So let's give some examples of these uh, to get an idea of what fasting looks like in the Bible. First, we see fasting as a means of pleading with God. And I want to say here, like others have indicated, fasting is never about manipulating God. It's used to, as a means to better communicate with God. We see this in Daniel 9 and 3 where Daniel is pleading with God on behalf of the nation of Israel. In 2 Samuel 12 and 16, David pleads with God in sackcloth and fasting on the ground, begging for his son not to die. Both of these, of course, are individual fasts, meaning David or Daniel, uh, neither one of those asked for other people to become a part of their fast. The second category of fasting is a a mourning or repentance Uh, mourning for their sins. We see this type of mourning in 2 Samuel 1, uh, 11 and 2, when David and his men were made aware that Jonathan and Saul uh, had died and they go in to mourning. Uh, We see mourning uh, statements of their sin and repentance. Um, When uh, Jonah goes in to Nineveh, he declares that God's going to destroy the city. And we see the king setting out a... um, a morning, uh, excuse me, not a morning, but a um, fasting for the entire city of Nineveh. And it just it wasn't for the humans, but it was also for their livestock. And that was a fasting of both food and drink. Uh, so then we see uh, fasting uh, by Paul after he met Christ and spent three days fasting from food or water uh, before Ananias came and told Paul to be baptized. The third and one of the most often used fast in a Christian's life is the fasting for spiritual direction or discernment. And we see this category of fasting used with both types, corporate and individual. First, we see it in Matthew 4 and 2. Jesus fasted 40 days and nights to prepare himself for his spiritual ministry and to be tempted by Satan. In the early church, we see uh, corporate fasting in Acts 13, 2 and 3. The leaders, the prophets, the teachers of Antioch were fasting and praying and worshiping. And the Holy Spirit gives them direction to appoint both Barnabas and Saul, uh, which Paul, as ministers to the Gentiles. In Acts 14, 23, we see both Paul and Barnabas praying and, and fasting for discernment to appoint elders in Galatia. So we have at least uh, three categories of fasting, pleading with God, mourning or repenting, and then spiritual discernment and direction, and two types, both individual and corporate. So it's biblical to fast individually, or it's biblical to fast collectively, and it's safe to say there's a variety of reasons that we can fast in our lives. 
Now let me kind of jump off on one of the last subjects that, that people like to quibble about. And Chase touched on this a little bit. Is fasting commanded? And the short answer is no, but it's expected. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6, which I hope sounds really familiar to you guys, uh, last week's te text uh, says, And when you fast, and when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Before this statement, Jesus says, And when you pray. And before that, he says, And when you give to the needy. And no one I know in their right mind thinks that we're not supposed to pray or we're not supposed to give to the needy. Yet some in the church want to look at this ancient discipline of fasting and say, well, it's not commanded, so we're not expected to fast. And I'd say that's a poor choice and you're missing out on a great uh, discipline. Uh, but wholeheartedly, I believe if great leaders, if kings, if prophets, if queens, if prophetess, if the greatest evangelist of all time, if God incarnate fasted, then I think it's implied and expected in a believer's life. So now I think John David wants to talk more about the reasons in our lives that we fast and the purpose that it serves. John. So let's talk about the purposes of fasting. So the very first time Jesus mentions fasting, he is talking about it in the context of motive in Matthew 6, what Keith was just talking about. See, Jesus knew how easy it was and is to make a spiritual discipline about ourselves, even a discipline like fasting. Like every discipline, fasting must forever be centered on God, on God. Luke 2, 37 tells of a prophetess named Anna. It says that she didn't ever leave the temple and she spent her time worshiping with fasting and praying day and night. I said that really quick, so let me repeat that. She was worshiping with fasting. Uh, that could also be translated as worshiping by fasting. Richard Foster wants to make the point that fasting and worshiping must be used in the same breath. He doesn't say that they're synonymous, but he does say that fasting is a means of worshiping. Zechariah 7, 5 says, when you fasted, was it for me that you fasted? A quote from the book, Celebration of Discipline, thanks Chase, says, if our fasting is not unto God, we have failed. Physical benefits, success in prayer, the enduing with power, spiritual insights, these must never replace God as the center of our fasting. John Wesley declares, first, let it, the, in the context of fasting, be done unto the Lord with our eye singly fixed on him. Let our intention herein be this and this alone, to glorify our Father which is in heaven. That is the only way we will be saved from the blessing more than the blesser. So the first purpose of fasting is this, to center our hearts on God and not ourselves. Let me repeat that. The first purpose of fasting is to center our hearts on God and not ourselves. The second purpose of fasting, uh, the second purpose fasting fulfills, there we go, is by revealing the things that control us. So we have a natural tendency as humans to believe we are in control. Fasting can reveal to us the things that control us, things like anger or bitterness or jealousy or strife or fear, etc., etc. you name it. And as funny as it sounds, we use food to cover all of this up. So when you fast, uh, especially fasting and abstaining from food, these things will just be resurfaced, things like your anger and bitterness, things that you will uh, focus on when you're not filling your bellies with food. But remember what Jesus said during his 40-day fast when he quoted Deuteronomy 8.3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So whatever we are covering up by eating food, remember that food does not sustain us. It's God that sustains us. So while we're abstaining from food, we are to be feasting on the word of God. And this means that in a way, fasting is feasting. In Matthew 6, uh, go back to that one more time, where Jesus first talks about fasting, we're told not to look miserable. Because in fasting, we're not miserable. 
We are feeding on God and thus being sustained by the word of God. Chase is going gonna, is gonna to close us out now. So the purposes of fasting are this. One, to center our hearts around God and two, to know that nothing else but God sustains us. I want to say those again just in case you miss them. The purposes of fasting are this. One, to center our hearts around God and two, to understand that nothing else but God can sustain us. Um, So if you want to dive deeper into this, I would encourage you to get the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Um, And with that being said, I'm going to pray us out. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Lord, thank you for revealing to us your will for fasting. Um, Lord, I ask that I ask that uh, whoever is able would do this, would take on this discipline as as a regular practice, um, however often that might be. Lord, I'm asking that you help us within this discipline to truly um, center our hearts around you and to truly help us to understand that nothing else but you will sustain us. Lord, in doing those things, we will have less of ourselves, and we will have more of you. And I ask you compel us to do those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night.